Uh, hello and welcome to Inside the Game. Now with the hurling and football championships up and running and last weekend being dominated by football, this week's show will have a hurling flavour to it. And with that in mind, two specially chosen guests join us now. Two-time All-Ireland winner James E. O'Connor, formerly of Clare, and a former Cork custodian who called time on his inter-county career just last year. And it will be a regular face on Sky Sports this year. Anthony Nash, gentlemen, delighted to have you along. Before we get into our hurling review and preview, let's just recap on the football results from last weekend. Up in Connacht, Mayo dispatching with Sligo. 32 points to 12 in the end. Relatively easy win for them. Aidan O'Shea to the four. Limerick, too good for Waterford. 418 to 12 points. And Kerry, far too good for Clare in the end. Colin Cullenside bows out of the Munster Championship. In Leinster, Offaly went, uh, went, got ahead of Loud, I should say. It took them extra time to do that. Wexford, 211 winners over Wicklow to 14 points. And uh, Longford, 25 points to Carlos, 213. Up in Ulster, well, the big news was Donegal beating down and Michael Murphy's hamstring continuing to cause him trouble. He limped out of that game in the first half. Donegal, 225 to 112 winners in the end in that one. There is a quarterfinal from Ulster on this weekend. Monaghan taking on Fermanagh. And on Sunday in the Connacht Senior Football Championship semi-finals, Ross Common playing Galway. And in Leinster, Leash West Meath, Meath Longford, Wexford's prize for getting over Wicklow is a game against Dublin and Kildare play Offaly. Armagh um, uh, taking on Antrim. The winners of that play, the winners of a Monaghan from Mana match. All right, let's run you through last weekend's hurling results. A couple of games in the Leinster Championship. Uh, Dublin beating Antrim 331 to 22 points. And Damien Fitzgerald, Wexford 531 to 123 Winners over Leash. Antrim and Leash will now play off to avoid returning to the Joe McDonough Cup. And the Munster quarterfinal saw Clare emerge victorious. 122 to 21 points against Liam Cowles, Waterford. All right, here are the fixtures. We will have a triple header for you on Saturday on Sky Sports. Two games from the Leinster Championship. The semi-final of Galway, Dublin and Kilkenny, Wexford. And we will finish with a big one from Munster. Cork taking on Limerick in the semi-final. The other semi-final from Munster will be played on Sunday. Temple Stadium, Tipperary hosting Clare. Now, just to give you an idea of how it will all pan out, victorious Clare face Tipperary. Limerick, Cork on the other side of the draw. Who will emerge to make the Munster final? All will be decided this weekend. OK, let's start our preview show by looking back over Clare's win over Waterford, Anthony Nash, Jamesy O'Connor. Jamesy, as a Clare man, a lot less comfortable in the end than maybe it should have been for Clare? Absolutely, Brian. I mean, dominated the game. 22 wides um, was the reason, you know, it was as uncomfortable as it was in the last the last quarter. I mean, the game appeared to be, you know, one from a long way out. But Waterford has been stuck to it and Clare's inefficiency and wastefulness um, almost saw them pay the, pay the price. But that said, lots of positives for Clare. I mean, you know, John Connell was excellent at centre back. Uh, Tony Kelly, Aaron Shanahan looked dangerous in the inside forward line. And Clare will know they're going to have to improve to beat Tipperary this weekend. But they're there. They have momentum after a desperate start to the league, and that's not a bad place to be in. Uh, one of the highlights for Clare in what was a difficult 2020 was Tony Kelly. He seems to have taken up in 2021 where he left off, left off last year, Anthony. Oh yeah, like Tony Kelly. You know, other teams are looking to plan to mark him. And that's one thing that wasn't mentioned really over the weekend is it took Waterford to put Callum Lyons, one of their most offensive defenders, to go back on him and kind of took him out of the game as well. And they actually did what Clare did to us years ago. They put Tony Kelly in the full forward line, even though we were planning for him in the centre for in the centre forward position. And when you do that, it upsets opposition. And Callum Lyons had to go back and be more defensive. And when he did come out towards the end of the game, it showed that it helped Waterford push on a little bit. But like Tony Kelly's in the form of his life. He's, you know, his prolonged career like has been just absolutely exceptional and he can do it from dead balls open play and he's just uh, he's just one of the best at the moment. Put a plan together, Anthony, to put the shackles on Tony Kelly. What are you thinking if you're delivering messages to your teammates? So what we used to do like was we'd either say, look, you're either following Tony Kelly all over the field and then you're isolating the likes of Jan Conlon and uh, Shane O'Donnell inside, which you don't want either, or else you're kind of sitting back and letting Tony Kelly have his have a bit of a field day and come back with the centre forward, maybe picking him up. So, like, you kind of robbing Peter to pay Paul is like one way or another. You know, do you let Tony Kelly potentially get man of the match? 
and try and stop goals against Clare or do you kind of do you go after him, try and put the shackles on him? But you're then going down to 14 men because you see with Callum Lyons in the first half, the last day, his sole job was to kind of try and keep Tony Kelly quiet. Um, so it's it's a very difficult thing and it's a great attribute for Clare to have. Yeah, James, before we look forward to uh, to Clare's well, reward for pushing past Waterford, which is a match against Tipperary this Sunday in the other semi final. A word on Waterford. Liam Cahill saying it's the flattest, one of the flattest performances in my time in charge. We could have been beaten by a lot more. Of course, you referenced the 22 wides in that match. Where to now for Waterford? Preliminary round winners they will face next on the weekend of July 17th or 18th or else the beaten Leinster semi-finalists. Well, I mean, what do they do, Brian? They've got to go back to the drawing board. Um, I think in his post-match interview, he, he referenced that, listen, jerseys are up for grabs now and that he was prepared to throw the, the kitchen sink at this. Um, clearly, though, the, the loss of you know so many important players from last year, Stephen O'Keefe, their goalkeeper, um, an outstanding player and leader, he retired. Ty de Borca obviously was lost to a crucial injury. And Conor Prunty and Jamie Barron um, didn't play. So, Brian, that's two-thirds of the spine of your team, goalkeeper, fullback, centre-back, and, and your best midfielder taken out. So, you know, when that became apparent, it, it was probably clear that the task was going to be uh, was going to be you know tougher. Um, hopefully, they'll have Prunty and Barron back um, for the qualifiers. Now, listen, there's still a lot of good players in that in that dressing room, and they'll be... You know, there'll be a lot of soul searching done and they'll be bitterly disappointed at, at, at how poorly they played and, and the lack of intensity that they that they brought. But um, I, I wouldn't write them off just yet. Um, you know, Cattle would certainly get a kick out of them, but it's going to be tough, Brian. They're looking now at five games in six weeks to get back to the All-Ireland and that's, that's a big, big ask. Yeah, that seems to be the consensus. The lack of intensity is something they were renowned for in 2020 was absent in that uh, that defeat to Clare. Craig, Clare's victory means they face a Tipperary side who they dismissed your Cork team from last year's championships, Anthony. Uh, when we look at this Tipperary side, we'll get a first championship look at them on the on the weekend. Uh, over reliance, some have suggested on a core group of players, or you could flip that around and said, say their foundations are based on a, on an aging but very very able group of uh, of men in the middle. Yeah, I'd agree with your second uh, statement, Brian. Say that like it's a great foundation to have. Those four players are starting most, if not all, championship teams at the moment. And like playing against them, unfortunately for me, I've been at the wrong end of a few games with them. And like you're at, you're, you're talking about four of the best players in the country. Like age, age is literally only a number. You talk about Patrick Horgan and TJ Reid, who are in the form of their lives. Both of them are older than any of those players. So like, you know, it, for me, I think it's a foundation. I think you've got some, you know, great players. And like we spoke about Man Mark and Tony Kelly and stuff like this, these fellas take it, take Man Mark in roles as well from opposition. Like Seamus Callanan has all the attributes. He's six foot two or three, big strong man, well able to move and intelligent. And like you know, he mixes up his game, which is what I love. He stays inside the edge of the square, he moves out around it, and he takes marking. And the one thing about Tipperary we always found against them was that they really use the ball intelligently and they're very selfless. And that's still there. And I don't care what age is on him, you know. Um there's talks about the pace going and stuff like that. But like Claire Claire will find it hard against Tipperary on Sunday. Um and this like this person here, Brendan Maher, like He's probably one of the most intelligent players I've ever played against um, and one of the most selfless players to ever come across. Um, so I, 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 I'd echo the sentiments of it being a foundation rather than being, a, rather than being an, aging, an aging group. Just if you can, just want to pick up on that point about an intelligent player on the field. Describe for the people at home watching this how an intelligent player, that you're an opposition player, how he stands out from all the others. Unfortunately, I was it was to my detriment. He, um, I think, was back in the early tens. I think in eleven or twelve, we played a match against them, and I went back and watched the video after, and it seemed to be wherever my ball was being pucked to, he was there, and it was just down to my body language. So whichever way I pucked the ball, Brendan Maher was actually already standing underneath it, and he was following the initial first run. So I actually had to go back and like we had a stats guy, Sean O'Donnell, at the time, who's now with Limerick, and we sat down. And we just said like this can't happen again, and it was just solely down to his intelligence where. He'd see the first run and knew that I was going to hit that first runner, and all of a sudden he'd be across there and cleaning up as well. Like, and it was just, and again, like it's just we saw it in the club championship years ago. Like, he's offensive threat as well. He's he's one of the best orders in the country, and it's not that he's you know uh, underrated by any means, but I just don't think he's talked highly enough about. He's he's one of the best I've ever seen play the game in. So, well, Jamesy, uh, high praise indeed from Anthony. He's not having it that it's a, a side lacking in pace, an aging team. As a Clare man, where are the alarm bells for you in this Tipperary side? Um, well, clearly the attacking threat, Brian. I mean, you know, I, I would argue that there's as much pace in this Tipperary team as, for example, you know, Watford have, or or maybe other sides, other sides have. But there's huge craft, there's huge skill, an incredibly high skill level. 
this huge experience, obviously. Um, and these guys know how to win big matches and, and particularly how to create how to create goals. So they'd have sat back and had a good long look at, at Clare and, and what Clare do. And you know, we saw Noel McGrath there, um, Brian. You know, Noel McGrath could very well be cited as centre forward. Uh, you know, we thought John Conlon playing a kind of withdrawn sweeper role, being imperious for Clare in the half back line, just sweeping and covering. But if Noel McGrath is, is, is playing number 11, you know, you can't give that guy the freedom of the park because, you know, he'll pick you for five, six, seven points from, from, from play. And he's done that in the in the past. So it's going to be really interesting tactically because Brendan Maher in the past as well has picked up Tony Kelly and Tipperary, arguably more than any other side, Brian, have done a really, really good job at curbing and curtailing his influence. So big decisions for Brian Lowe and, you know, where does he play Kelly? Where is he starting? Um, and Liam Sheedy on the other side trying to figure out, OK, if Kelly lines up on the inside forward line, you know, do we stick Carl Barrett on him? Does Brennan Maher do a, a man-marking job? Um, but I still think Tip aren't the side that they were, Brian, three, four or five years ago. I mean, you know, father time at the same time doesn't stand still. And, and you know, certainly Parik Maher, Brennan Maher, Noel McGrath, Callan, even Bonner Maher, who's, who's gone for the season to injury. Um, you know, these guys have given incredible service, but they can't be, in my mind, as good um, as they were, you know, e- even three years ago. And even even when Dean Sheedy came back in 2019, Brian, you know, I was wondering, could he ring another year from these guys' career or, or was it a case of, of doing a complete rebuild? And they got their answer when they won the All-Ireland. So, um, yeah, can they hit the same heights as they've done in the past? Clearly, we're going to have to find a way to stop them. Time stands still for no man, but when I look at the photos in your Hall of Fame behind you, James, you haven't done too bad 40 years ago now and counting. Right, uh, let's Please, look yeah. forward to Saturday, the final of our games on the triple header. We're going to be bringing you on Sky Sports Cork Limerick in Turles. This is an interesting one here. We've got uh, a clash almost of, of, uh, of styles in a sense. We've got a very settled Limerick side. Everybody knows what to expect from them. Everybody, Anthony, seems to be putting faith in Cork's running game, the speed of Cork's attack, to give them a chance, any chance, pushing past Limerick. Well, I suppose if you're looking at teams' best attributes, it is Cork's best attribute. Like um, during the league campaign, there they rattled up a load of goals, and uh, like I, there's players there that I've trained beside, and uh, like Shane Kingston here is on, on video here. We did a training session there about geez, five six years ago, and here I was doing an outfield role for some strange reason, but he ran around me, and I've never seen pace like it. But the one thing you'll find is, and a couple of these clips here, when a team allow Cork build it out from the back, we look very very good. But what Limerick did to Cork in the league is what they will try and repeat. They will try and stop Cork from running that ball. They will try and stop Cork from working out from the back and make them go more direct. Because, look, it's not a... I suppose there's no big secret behind it, like the over-dependence and Seamus Harnady in the half-forward line for us to have an out-ball. Um, and then, obviously, Hoggy inside, like, who is, you know, like, he's 33, like, and we're talking about Tipperary's age, but for me, he's playing the hurling of his life. So, like, Limerick will obviously done their homework again from the league campaign, and so will Cork. But I think Cork are in a position where they just have to stick with it. They're after persisting for the whole league on this running game. Yes, Limerick turned them over and uh, you know fairly fairly comprehensively in the league, but like you can't throw the baby out with the batwater now and just say, right, that's it, we're going long, because you're going down long on top of Dear Burns, Declan Hannon and a few more. So it, it is two contrasting styles, but I think Cork have to go at their strength, and the strength is the pace. You bowed out at the end of last year. If you look at the goals that Cork have scored in the league, I think it goes four in 2019, 11 in 2020, 18 in the league this year, was there a conscious and a concerted effort within the side to, to target goals? There seemed to be a training anyway, because they were always getting them past me. <laughs> um, but <laughs> yeah, like it was always there over time. Like, you know, it's like we would have gotten kind of criticism and maybe it was, you know, heralded as well, like, but that we didn't score enough goals or whatever like that. But like we, we looked at a few stats and we were one of the top scoring, uh, goal scoring teams uh, for a couple of years and we were still told we weren't scoring enough goals. But um, there was always a balance truck. And even going back to Jimmy Barry Murphy's days, Jimmy was encouraging us to go for goals and stuff. But when the point is on, it's obviously keep the scoreboard ticking over. There seems to be a big shift this year right towards the more defensive cohesion and allowing Mark Coleman to play in that kind of a sweeping role, um, getting him on the ball. Because as important as Patrick Horgan is up front, Mark Coleman for Cork on the ball defensively is is as important. But um, that's the biggest change for me about the defensive setup, allowing the six to sit deep and working the ball out, you know, sharp from the back. But... Um, but as I said, they were getting them in training, so they seem to be transferring them to the field this year. How much will they need them, James? Either going up against the All Ireland champions, some suggesting that without goals, Cork have no chance of pushing past Limerick. Yeah, I, I, I think they're going to need two, three, maybe more, Brian. Um, I mean, listen, t- to be fair to, to Kieran Kingston, I don't think Cork had, have, have any chance trying to take on Limerick and play Limerick or try to beat Limerick playing Limerick's game. You know, they have to come with something different. And there's no doubt in my mind, I mean, I saw them a couple of times during the league 
and there was clearly a change of mindset when in the past, you know, players like Alan Cadigan or, or, or Hoggy might have been content to tap the ball over the bar. You know, this season, you know, they, they, they were, there was definitely a level of intent that they were looking for more. That if the goal was on or if there was any possible of, you know, running at defenders and asking a few more questions, that was the, that was a mindset. And we saw that um, certainly in the uh, in the league. Now, clearly, they didn't show their hand against Limerick. And Limerick were up for, up for that game and, and put them to the sword pretty quickly. And Limerick would be, you know, keen to... To I suppose lay down the markers early on and bring all that physicality and that power and that aggression in the middle in the middle third of the field. But I'm expecting a massive performance from Cork um, on Saturday evening. And they're the one side, Brian, that has given Limerick as much trouble as anybody in the in the country. I mean, you know, you you, you go back to kind of 2018 and they they, they drew in the, the round robin. Um, obviously the semi final went to extra time and Limerick beat them in the champ. Or sorry, Cork came to Limerick and beat Limerick in the championship in 2019. So they have a good record, but it's going to be a huge ask to take down the champions. Yeah, uh, John Kiley said, I'm not looking at that league game, that win over Cork at all. Kieran Kings is saying that first, the first half of that game was probably the only blot, the major blot in their league performance. Gentlemen, prediction time. I want you to give me the Munster finalists. We want to start with our guest, Anthony Nash, on this one. Munster final contenders. Or, sorry, who will play off in the Munster finals? An easy way of putting it this year, Anthony. Oh, it's a tricky one for me. <laughs> um, I've a cousin playing for Limerick and I've given up for Cork. So, um Oh, Jeannie, I'll have to put my hair. Uh, probably have to go Cork and Tip. Cork and Tipperary. Jamesy, Claire are out. Yeah. Anthony Nash. Uh, yeah, well, they're, they're probably out according to Jamesy O'Connor as well. It'll be the kiss of death, Brian, to, to tip them. For me, Limerick, Limerick play Tipperary in the final. Okay, uh, gentlemen, we will see. And you can see how the uh, one of the semi finals unfold. It's our third game on Saturday from the triple header. It's our pleasure to bring you here on Sky Sport uh, Arena. We'll start with Galway Dublin, 1 p.m. for the Leinster Hurling Championship. That will be followed in Crow Park by Kilkenny Wexford. It's 4,000 expected, or 8,000, I should say, expected in Crow Park for that. Great to see some sizable crowds coming back. And it'll all end in uh, Thurles on Saturday. Cork taking on Limerick in the first of the Munster semi final. 6 30 p.m. Sky Sports Arena. Okay, we're going to leave it there for part one of Inside the Game. Join us after the break. Please, as we preview the Leinster semi-finals in the company of James O'Connor and Anthony Nash. Welcome back to Inside the Game. Just a note for the diary. We can't give you much more hurling this Saturday on Sky Sports. A triple header. Back-to-back -back games from the Leinster Hurling Championship. Galway taking on Dublin, Crow Park, 1pm. That is followed by Kilkenny, Wexford. 8,000 expected in Crow Park. That's a 4pm start. And we'll end it all on Saturday in Thurles as Cork take on Limerick in the Munster Hurling semi-final. 6.30pm for that one on Sky Sports Arena. OK, our focus now in part two will be on Leinster. Dublin beating Antrim and Wexford beating Leash. That means Wexford, Kilkenny and Dublin Galway are the semi-final pairings. And let's start our preview by focusing on that Galway-Dublin game. Consistency of selection in, in Dublin's side, James. Just 28 players used in their league campaign. Then they beat uh, Antrim in the championship. What, if anything, can we read into the performance against Antrim? Or was that the bare minimum that Dublin needed to do to suggest that they would have any chance of sticking it to Galway on the weekend? Well, Brian, prior to the game, there was a lot of speculation that, you know, Antrim had arguably as good a league campaign as anybody. And, um, you know, there was a lot of talk that Dublin were going to be vulnerable and, and, and going to face a real battle. But, you know, I felt that Dublin had been operating at a higher altitude than Antrim in recent years. And it was a pretty emphatic performance and a super goal there by Keno Sullivan. You know, he played well at corner forward. Ronan Hayes, as Anthony said, was really good at full forward. And here we see the other Burke coming forward from centre-back. Beautiful pass here to Hayes into the hand and he buries it. Um, so Dublin did all that could be asked of them, um, you know, last weekend, Brian. And, and to post 331 against an Antrim side that, remember, drew with Wexford, beat Clare in the league, and Keane Boland getting Dublin's third goal there. Um, that was about as much as, as could have been expected. And they have to take confidence, um, you know, into the game on, on, on Saturday. Don't forget as well, I mean, two years ago in 2019, they, they, they beat Dublin in a must-win game in Pernell Park. Um, so, you know, they'll have to believe that, look, at if they play to the... The standard of that the, the, they hit on that occasion, then they have a chance. But Galway's form, you know, has been really, really impressive on the other side, and, and they deserve to start as favourites. Yeah, Galway winning four out of five in their league campaign. Anthony, are they going up? Dublin, I'm talking about now. Are they going up against the side in the top two teams in the competition? 
Oh, absolutely. I think if you're looking, I know, I know I predicted Cork to beat Limerick, but I think if you're looking at the All-Ireland, I think you're looking at Limerick and Galway. Um, they have everything. They've got physique, pace, power, skill, you everything. found that reverse um, gear, didn't you? Yeah, I had to try and do something like I said, I'm going down training in Limerick tonight, so it's a bit, uh, it's a bit of a tricky one. Um, what, like, what, what I will say is that Galway have every attribute in the game. Um, like when you look for me, Cahill Mannion is is becoming the Tony Kelly of Galway. I think he's just absolutely a breath of fresh air to watch. Um, throw Joe Canning in there on top of like Dahi Burke and geez, if size physique, the whole lot. Um, and that's why I'm kind of being a little bit cautious or a little bit, you know, not negative about Dublin. But I just, I just can't see Galway being turned over this weekend. Um, I think they'll win Leinster as well. But uh, they just have every attribute that they need to win in All Ireland as well, with skill and power and pace. So I, 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 I would be putting them well up there with Limerick to to have a good crack off the All Ireland. Yeah. Okay, that's going to be game one of our double header from Leinster. So let's look at uh, game two, four thirty p.m. Uh, on Sky Sports at Crow Park, as I said, eight thousand uh, spectators expected in Crow Park. The game having been moved from Port Leash, Kilkenny against Wexford. Kilkenny's first outing in the twenty twenty one championship. Wexford beat Leash five thirty one to one twenty three. Lee Chin interviewed during the week. He said the motivation for the performance against Leash was the disappointment of twenty twenty. You got to find some motivation, and they were a disappointment in twenty twenty. Uh, let, let's talk about that, Anthony. Uh, h- how far can that drive you the following year? I mean, you do need the the raw materials to work with, but a disappointing season the season before. How much can that work in your favour the next year? I don't believe a Davy Fitzgerald teams needs motivation <laughs> when he's at the helm. Um, it definitely does hurt, and it hurts mainly over the winter. And you have a long campaign, you know, you're walking through towns and meeting people and stuff like that as well. And, you know, they're they're either being really nice and saying that you were unlucky or they're giving it to you. So um, I can kind of feel where they're coming from. All right. Uh, look, Wexford or Wexford, they they play a different style of hurling to, to most teams. So they're a very difficult team to play against. Um, and like when you have the likes of Lee Chen and Conor McDonald playing, like you, you always stand a chance as well. And look, there was talks that Davey was maybe going this year. Like maybe this is his last year. You don't know, you'd never know, but... I think they won't be lacking motivation for this year's championship anyway. When you say a different style to everybody else, are you meaning by the way they work it through the lines? Is that yeah. just to expand expand on that if you would? Yeah, so it's the creation of the sweeper. Like they play with an all out sweeper, like and they work back and at times there you could take it of two forwards in the opposition's half and everyone else is behind the ball and they work it out from the back and then they deliver it up and there's no set positions in their forward and we've we haven't played them that much in championship, but we've played them a good few times in challenge matches. And next thing, Lee Chin will be midfield and two minutes later, he's standing in the edge of the square on top of you. So they seem to have a good cohesion with each other that they know when a fella drops back to get the ball, works it out. And then the next guy appears and they only seem to have one or two set players in the forward line, one being Conor McDonald. But um, it's it's a difficult place to play against, or teams to play against, because when you're trying to deliver a ball in, you're looking at a blanket of Wexford jerseys. It, it has been suggested, Jamesy, that although they do that very well, plan A goes goes well for them many times. A plan B is missing from uh, from Wexford's arsenal. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I think to an extent, Brian. I mean, certainly Galway, you know, are the one side that always have seemed to have had their number. Um, and I don't think Wexford are, are necessarily equipped to come from behind. So, you know, if if, if they fall behind or have to chase, you know, and, and find themselves five or six points in the rears, um, you know, in, in invariably I think they struggle um, in that scenario. Now, if it's very, very tight and if they're ahead, um, well, then they can play defensively. They can suck you up the field and, and, and maybe create those overlaps and, and those opportunities um, at the uh, at the other end. But uh, they've been Kilkenny's kryptonite over the last number of years, Brian. I mean, you know, beat them obviously in the Leinster final um, in, in, in 20, 2019. Obviously, we know that Kilkenny ended up back in the back in the final. But Wexford really, you know, had the winning of that Ireland semi-final against Tiberi and left it after them. And that's why last year was so disappointing that they didn't kick on when everyone felt that they were within touching distance of of maybe the Holy Grail. Uh Kilkenny still dependent on TJ Reid um, up front. Uh, you know, again, this is probably Kilkenny arguably at a, at a lower ebb than they've been maybe in, in some respects, Brian, in, in, in many years in the sense that not many people within the county seem to to fancy their chances of All-Ireland success. But Brian Cody's, you know, the, the, the performance levels never dip below a certain level. And Adrian Mullen was back and I thought hurled really well against Clare in the, in, in the league. Walter Walsh, he's back. Hopefully he's available. There's no Colin Fennelly, obviously. But some of the, you know, the supporting cast, Billy Ryan, James Bird, and some of these guys are going to have to step up on Cody um, in attack for Kilkenny. I still think they'll win, Brian. Um, but it won't be without its difficulties. And uh, and this is a game that, that, that's arguably 50-50. 
Okay, but you've gone for Kilkenny. Gone for Kilkenny, yeah. On 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 the basis yeah. there's you know there's still they're they're still look at burning after that that third quarter fade out against Watford last year when they must be kicking themselves that they they weren't back in the final. Okay, Leinster final is Galway against Kilkenny, says James E. O'Connor. Anthony Nash, you've already put Galway in there. Who do they meet? 50-50, like James said as well, and I'd, I'd also agree to Kilkenny as well, but it's a close, it's going to be, it's the, it is going to be a close one because you have such different styles. And just to go back to James's point and why I think Galway had the better edge over them over the years is Galway's use of the ball out from defence nearly nullified the sweeper for Wexford. If Kilkenny do what they did years ago and just kept hoofing the ball down and hoping for catching and, you know, individual like TJ Reid's brilliance, then Wexford will come out on top. But if they work the ball out from the back and use their sweeper, whoever that'll be in the night, um, I think that they'll get the edge all right, yeah. You think and we saw it and we saw evidence, Brian, of that style just on that. We saw definitely evidence during the league of Kilkenny, you know, playing it short, playing it differently, yeah. adapting to the challenge that Wexford uh, posed, and clearly with, with, with maybe Wexford in that championship semi final in mind. Absolutely, absolutely. Okay, yeah. so it's Kilkenny for both of you. Yeah, yeah. All right, gentlemen, we will revisit these predictions, and you will be reminded, no doubt, if you're wrong, by the good folk of Dublin and Wexford. My thanks to James E. O'Connor and Anthony Nash for their company here on Inside the Game. Just a reminder, on Sky Sports, this Saturday, a triple header of championship hurling action. 1 p.m. Galway, Dublin. 4 p.m. Kilkenny, Wexford. And at 6.30 p.m. with an announce Turles for Cork against Limerick. Hope you can join us for those. And indeed, next Wednesday, 10 p.m. on Sky Sports Arena for another episode of Inside the Game. We'll look back on those matches and look forward to some football championship action as well. Till next time, bye-bye. Sky Sports. Feel it all.